Okay, hey, welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna be talking about News 21, which is one of the uh, professional programs here at the Cronkite School. This one, however, not only involves ASU students, but students from around the country who end up coming um, for a summer to work on a project. As you probably know or can gather, um, this summer we did a project on hate in America. Um, came after a lot of the uprisings that have been going on and turned out to be very predictive of a lot of things um, that are happening in the country right now involving um, hate or bias against people of color, people of different religions, et cetera. Um, to just give you a quick background about the uh, program, because I really want um, Ashley Mackey, Justin Parham, and Angel Mendoza to really talk about their experiences doing this. Um, but we chose the topic because for obvious reasons there seems to be a lot of tension in the country right now involving race and religion and a number of other things. Um, the program is funded by, in part by the Knight Foundation, which supports many of the ASU students who are participate, and then in the summer, um, national students from around the country come. So this year we had um, 38 students from 19 universities. ASU was one of those. And we spend the spring semester doing research and some reporting on the project, and then everyone comes together in the newsroom um, and works on whatever their specific assignment is. Um, I'm gonna start, if we could, with a, a clip, if you haven't seen it, from the trailer that we did for our documentary that gives you a good idea of sort of um, how we viewed the project and where we went. I will say that this project, compared to other projects we've done in News 21, was much more stressful. Um, we went to places that were difficult places to go. We interviewed people who were, um, had very radical views, but whose views as journalists, you probably know, also need to be heard. Um, and the trailer will reflect some of what we did. The Ku Klux Klan was right there in my backyard. They made announcements in church, stay in your home, stay locked up. There was an unknown body found in the road. We don't know what's going on in Jasper. This long trail that we followed for a couple miles was actually part of a human being. They tied him right back up to the truck and continued to drag him and left his body in front of Black Cemetery. Over 4,000 lynching, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of death. We're not in it to hate anybody. We're in it to look out for our own. Not to tear anybody down, but to reserve what's ours. I thought that we were all going to die in the house. I thought we were going to get uh, burned up in the house. See, they think they're sanctified by God to commit these acts of violence in anything they do. The long shadow of slavery still exists in our nation. America still has not faced up to its racism and repudiated it once and for all. I was thinking about the, the possibility of a future as a minority, and it, it's absolutely uh, not one that I look forward to. A lot of things from the past were starting to come to the surface, like what happened in Charlottesville. the purposes of News 21 and the reason it was created was for a group of um, aspiring journalists, um, visual journalists, writers, uh, whatever it may be, to create every year a project that's innovative and controversial and has an important impact on the country. Um, I've already explained to you why we chose the topic of hate, but I wanted to describe to you a little bit about what's that like. So we visited more than two dozen states to do this story. Uh, we worked in a lot of uncomfortable situations. Um, the 
reporters that are here will talk about some of those. Um, but we felt it was a very important story to tell, and one of the things that I will tell all of you, depending on what you aspire to do, is you will never be good at what you do unless you're uncomfortable doing it at different times. And I think it's pretty obvious that this was, at times, an uncomfortable project to be working on. Um, so I'm going to ask Justin to talk a little bit first about uh, his experiences. He did a lot of the shooting for the documentary. Um, he interviewed the Im Grand Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, um, which I fretted quite a bit about, but that turned out okay, um, as well as other people. And I think the most important thing that you can learn from all of this is what they learned from all of this in producing this project. So if you could, Justin, tell us a little bit about your experiences, especially with the documentary, and maybe even your encounters with the various um, sort of white supremacist and national groups that you uh, interviewed and photographed. So like Jackie stated, I uh, had the opportunity to serve as a director on this project. And throughout my time, I spent some time in Mississippi. Uh, I had to interview a Klansman uh, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Very strange ex experience, but like you said, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. So in that situation, I just had to put any bias that I could have aside and just let him tell his story because as a journalist, you have to be able to allow people to share their stories. Uh, also on that trip, I got to meet an uh, older lady who was victims of clans, Klansmen. So I had the opportunity to hear her story. And then in Detroit, we met with uh, the National Socialist Movement. So I was able to interview a guy who was the leader of that, uh, Jeff Scoop. If you watch the documentary, you'll see some words from him. But uh, like Jackie said earlier, you have to be prepared to just go into a situation and make the best of that situation. You never know what's going to happen. So you have to be prepared at all times to whether it may go good or it may go bad. But at the end of the day, you have to be ready. Um, and were there any specific moments, if I could ask you, that you were really uncomfortable doing what we have to do, what journalists do all the time? I'm sure that's the case for everybody sitting here at different times. But was there? To be honest, I wasn't uncomfortable because I prepared for it going into it. You know, I had many talks with you, had many talks with Lynn about what we were going to be doing on this project. So I think if you pre prepare yourself for what's going to happen, then you can make sure that when you get in that situation that even though you may be uncomfortable, you're comfortable in, what, in doing what you have to do. Because at the end of the day, the story needs to be told. And if you don't tell that story, then who will? I think one of the things that Justin's talking about that's very important to the future of storytelling is the ability to, um, and, and this is what News 21 was really created for, is to tell stories that are deep, not just stories that are superficial, and to tell stories that aren't easy to do, but to tell stories that are very hard to do, and in fact often make you uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be a situation where you have um, a black reporter talking to a member of the Ku Klux Klan, which is a little bit more of an extreme example. But there are often going to be times when whatever kind of work you do, you are uncomfortable, and that's part of what News 21 is all about. One of the other things we did for this project, um, Chris, if you don't mind showing the road trip real quick. Um, one of the things that I ha wanted to do this year was to get a better sense of how Americans across the country actually felt about what I'm going to call the state of hate. Have we become more hateful? Have we become more prejudiced? Have, have politics played a part of that? And I'm not talking about any particular politician, just politi politics in general. Is there such a division between the right and the left, if you will, um, that uh, regular Americans feel it. So one of the things that we did was to, we want the road trip. Chris, can you find it? I know. Um, so my idea was is that we take a group of reporters and drive in a, we used an SUV in an entire loop around the entire country, and that what we would do is not interview predictable sources, but to pull over in places right, where right, we would meet right, regular right. people and ask Indeed. them how they felt about how America was today and how we treated each other and whether there was 
um, a, a particular increase or feeling that it was okay to be racist or it was okay to be anti-Semitic. And so part of that project, um, we traveled, I think, uh, was it 3,600 miles? I should know that, but I don't off the top of my head. Um, and we interviewed regular people about how they felt. Why is that important? I think um, from a storytelling perspective and the purposes of News 21, that's important because we often go to the normal people you would go to to get the answers you hope to get. In this case, we were talking to um, people from around the country who just had their you know, very um, distinct views of how it affected their everyday life. Know, just by talking to those communities that there are so many more incidents that they're not even reporting because the sense that somehow this is typical. We as trans Latinas specifically. This is, uh, this isn't the right one. I'm sorry. Are. The the road trip. It's not in this economic platform. We like, everything you're saying is so rational. It sounds so. Or Antifa didn't show up. Unrest in our country. It's, you're gonna have, you're probably gonna have to go to the, back to the homepage. No, keep going, keep going. There it is. There you go. Um, we call, okay, there you go. We traveled 7,000 miles um, across 23 states where we um, talk to people from different paths of life, and then we also mapped it out so that you could click in anywhere and see what a regular person had to say about what was happening in the country at any given time. So, uh, and one of the reasons for doing this is that another important aspect of News 21, besides the investment in the future and the amount of um, money that we spend, which is a lot because we have students who traveled all across the country, is to make sure that we are being inclusive in the way we're doing reporting, that we're not always going to predictable sources. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Ashley to talk a little bit about uh, religious um, bias and her work on that story, which also turned out, as I mentioned, to be um, an important issue, as we know, since, there, uh, since just several months after that, we had the shooting in the synagogue. Um, yeah, so I was one of the leaders for the religious bias group. Um, we put together a 10-minute documentary and um, a written piece to go along with it. And um, we traveled to New York City, um, St. Louis, Missouri, Murfreesboro, Nashville, we, we interviewed people here in Phoenix, um, Oregon. So um, we, got, we got a lot of interviews and I think one of the biggest things with, with this topic was trying to not put our own kind of mindset on it. So just kind of listening, like that was the biggest thing, like letting them tell their story instead of us telling their story. Um, and you, you would think it's easy to do given that your voice is not tracking over um, the story, but it's actually, it, it takes a lot to like piece together and kind of find that thread that kind of weaves everything together. So we, we looked into um, the Sikh population, the Muslim population, and the Jewish population. And we kind of tried to weave all of those together into a 10 minute documentary in a long form, um, in depth, investigative written piece. And, um, we're, we're going to show that clip here in a second, but one of the things I want to point out is I don't know how many of you um, do video work or how many of you are interested in broadcast, but Ashley brings up a very important aspect of News 21 is, is that there is no narration for the video. So that means that everything you shoot, every character you build, every place you go to, that you have to find a way to seamlessly tell the story without a person narrating it. And that requires a lot more um, dedication to detail and getting um, what I hesitate to call B-roll because often um, we use the term B-roll to f refer to anything we can shoot that will fill in for something we don't have. In this case, this is shooting B-roll that every single shot really needs to be important to the story you're telling. Um, so let's go ahead and show a part of this or most of it. I'll let you know.
for me as a Sikh, the aspects of my religious identity are so personal that if someone was to try and violate them in any way, that's not an attack just on those articles. It's not just an attack on me as an individual. It's something much deeper than that. The moment a hate crime happens against someone because of their appearance, that puts every other person with that same appearance on alert. And to have that happen constantly over and over again for years and decades, I mean, you can just imagine what kind of psychological trauma that has for a community. That these people know every time they walk out of their house, they can be targeted in an attack, not for any other reason, but because of how they look. So my father first moved to this country during the sort of Iran crisis. Um, he was called Iranian as a slur, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, these were like things that people would hurl at him. Growing up for me, a lot of it was around Operation Desert Storm and our engagement with Iraq. So it was Saddam, uh, Sand or Raghead, those were very common. Around 9-11, it became Al-Qaeda, Bin Laden, Taliban. Today it's ISIS, terrorist. And actually one of the unique things today is um, Muslim has become a very common slur that I hear. It also sort of highlights the fact that a lot of this hate is rooted in ignorance because people are assuming that I'm Muslim when I'm not. After September 11th, we saw a dramatic increase in anti-Muslim hate crimes. Though unjustified, is expected because there's a massive tragedy. Within one year after September 11th, the anti-Muslim hate crimes went to historic lows. In 2008, a few things happened all at once. Number one, the Great Recession. Number two, you had the first African-American becoming the president of the United States, and another person who's now our current president basically tried to disqualify that person saying, you know, he's not American, and actually he might be a secret Muslim. So when you saw the merging of anti-Muslim bigoted rhetoric and anti-Muslim bigoted organizations become politicized and become a tool, particularly of one party, that is when we now see a dramatic increase in anti-Muslim hate crimes in the country today. In 2013, um, I was assaulted by a group of about 20 to 30 men uh, in a hate crime in Harlem, uh, where I lived at the time. I suffered a fractured jaw and other injuries. It was the third time I'd been attacked since 9-11, and so I felt differently after the third time than I did the second and first time. By the third time, I had processed it was more educated myself about the context of hate crimes. I felt that it was more important for me to actually uh, say something afterwards, recognizing that it wasn't just about me. For it to be classified as a hate crime, the... Uh... We can go ahead and stop it. So if you notice um, here, you, we have a very focused, um, you know, idea of what the characters have to say about what's happened to them. Um, and again, this requires like a lot of setup, a lot of getting people to talk to you. And these aren't people that are down the street or, you know, from the Cronkite School. They're places that we had to travel. Can you talk a little bit, Ashley, about the people that you did talk to and how you got them to talk to you and how you got to have this sort of um, license to shoot that the, way, the way that you did? Um, yeah, so... Uh, it, the process doesn't start in the summer when we get here. It starts in January when we um, do the News 21 seminar uh, in the spring semester. Um, <clears throat> and that's when we're starting to basically email and call everybody and just see who responds and see what they respond with so we can kind of get a feel of where the story may be because you never really know. Um, and then actually, I think I put like, there's like 10 interviews in this one 10 minute video. And I probably left out like 10 more sources that I interviewed. So this was, it was really hard. <laughs> I think the video was at like 20 minutes when I first put it all together and they were like, no. Um, but y y you don't really know where the story is or where it's gonna take you. And you, know, you just kind of have to just go, really. I re yeah, it was a lot of pivoting. It was a lot of, I don't get an um, email back for months or from since January, and then we're here in the summer, and the National Organization um, for the Jewish Federation in New York 
emails me back and says, oh, yeah, sure. Sorry, I just saw this email. And so now we have to go to New York. <laughs> and it's like, that's great, you know. So we're going to New York. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it was very, like, just be ready to go. I should mention that one of the aspects of this program is that, uh, I mean, I mentioned it early on, but um, specifically what Ashley's talking about, you'll see, as you've seen from some of these clips, we were all over the place. And um, A, it's because it's a national project, and B, because the perspective is to be able to talk to people in different places, many of them outside of your comfort zone. And so whatever kind of work that all of you end up doing, um, in which I hope you will be very successful, one of the things you always have to do is to stretch outside your, country, your comfort zone, um, whether that's being at a rally where things get dicey and somewhat violent um, or threatening or whatever it might be, all of which happened on this trip at various times. Um, that's what has to happen, and you have to feel like you're comfortable with it. Or if you're not comfortable with it, you have to act like in front of people that you are. Um, so, Angel, before we go on, could you talk a little bit about the Latino story and um, some of the challenges you faced and what you took away from that? Sure, Jackie. So I was Oh, wait. Part Let me stop. I forgot to say one yeah, thing. Sure. So um, Angel's story uh, was picked up in was carried on the cover of USA Today, the front page of USA Today. Uh, one of the aspects of this project is that we have national partners who um, we have um, partnered with for, for years since we've had the program, um, and we are working on furthering those partnerships. So there's nothing, um, I'm sorry, on the front of the Arizona Republic. Did I say USA Today? That was a different one, Arizona Republic. But we also were on the cover of USA Today. OK, go now. Sure, yeah, to further clarify, um, what was on USA Today was our overview story. So that one basically covered everything that um, this entire 39-person team did over the entire summer. So technically, we were all on yeah. the cover of USA Today. But luckily, my story, some well, not my story, but I was a part of a three-person team, and uh, that one got on the Arizona Republic over here because it was Latino and immigrant um, bias and issues that affect those people. So it was kind of relevant more to the Southwest um, population. But anyway, um, yes, again, I was part of a three-person team. It was me, another print writer, and uh, someone who did the documentary bits. But basically, our task was to figure out a story that encompasses basically what the big national story is with hate against Latinos and immigrants. That's kind of a big thing. It was a big thing when Jackie proposed it to us. It took us weeks upon weeks of stumbling in the dark and tripping over and getting zero responses from people before we f figured out very quickly um, where the story was going to take us. And uh, it took us to California, Oregon, Texas and Florida. Um, I specifically didn't go to Oregon, but uh, the story that my partners found over there was very important to the telling of our story. But what I do remember was in California, we um, met transgender Latina immigrants who told us their stories of hate and violence. Um, that group was particularly um, kind of just very heartbreaking. Um, to cover because, you know, if you look at her story, I'm not exactly sure what the figure is, but 97% um, or so of hate crimes that happened uh, to uh, transgender, Latina, transgender Latina immigrants or transgender Latinas were violent um, hate crimes. They can be just hate incidents or they can be hate crimes. They can be just name calling, slurs, that kind of thing. But 97% of the ones that happened towards transgender Latinas were violent. And I remember specifically an interview that I had with uh, this woman who was a CEO of the Trans uh, Latina Coalition in uh, Los Angeles. So they provide resources to transgender Latinas and everything like that. So she was in a very uh, important source in telling us not only her story of abuse and, um, and hate, uh, but she also knows people that she works with who have gotten you know, just on a daily basis, just getting called these the worst names possible and, you know, getting beat up and even killed, that kind of thing. And one thing that will always stick with me, I think, from researching this in L.A. was I was in an interview with her. 
it's going along kind of fine. She gets a little emotional. And then halfway through, I kind of take over and go, so can you tell me the most extreme um, kind of things that you've seen happen to people that you work with? She couldn't say anything for like about 30 seconds. She got really choked up. She tried to utter the name of this person. Her name was Vicky Gutierrez. She was a transgender Latina immigrant over in Pico Union, Los Angeles, which is a very kind of rough part of the neighborhood. And specifically what made this jarring to me and everyone who was in that room was that this person wasn't only um, killed, but she was stabbed and burned alive in her home just for being who she was, transgender Latina immigrant. And she was, you know, um, just someone who wanted to do her own thing and made her own choices and everything like that. But just because of being who she was, she was one person. Uh, I remember his name, Kevin Ramirez. He uh, apparently, you know, it, it Did gets... Did they ever prosecute someone in that case? I don't remember. Um, I, do the last time I remember, I believe he was going to... Um, they had arrested someone. They arrested someone. He, Kev, uh, Ramirez was going to plead not guilty, I believe, the last time I kept up with it. But going forward, as um, this woman was trying to remember her old friend, um, she, she basically tells me all the grisly details and everything like that. And I'll never forget it. She looked at me straight in the eyes, and then she goes, so I don't know what more extreme you could want, which alluded to the fact that there was way more stories out there that, you know, happened to these people in LA. So um, that's just one state of our um, four, I'll consider Arizona part of our reporting, but our four state journey. Um, over in Dallas, I, I spoke with um, two young Latino women. They are they're, they're in their 20s, and what made their story unique to um, the Latino immigrant story was that they're daughters of, of immigrants, and they had their own um, situations of hate and bias, but they had their own specific worries, you know, with taking care of their parents. What happens if their parents leave? And to, they would just get specifically just very emotional whenever they had to think about what would happen if their parents were taken away from them, that kind of thing. Um, and then over in Florida, we decided to uh, investigate this practice called guat hunting, where people would whenever it was payday and there were Guatemalan immigrants who worked for just cash, whenever there was payday, there would be these people who would just go out and beat these people up for their money, that kind of thing. There was one specific case um, against this 18-year-old. He was 18. His name was Onisimo. He was a Guatemalan immigrant who was beaten with a, a, a rock and an ax um, by, by three white men. Um, we didn't get to talk to Onisimo's family, but we did talk to a Guatemalan immigrant who um, had heard about the incident. Actually, no, I don't think she heard about it, but she had her own worries for sure. She uh, she is a mother of three kids, and this woman, Guatemalan immigrant, again, she had her own um, violent experiences, but she also told us not only that, she told us all the worries she faces every day. She drives her kids like a mile to school, but every day she, she kind of lives in the fear that she will get deported. And... Um, the immigration issue it takes a big part in our story as well. So, um. so one of the things that was a theme throughout this project is people being literally fearful of their life because of people who choose to target them for whatever reason. Um, and I, I and if I'm not mistaken, some of that is addressed in this video, correct? Yeah. So but let's yeah, look. The, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. What you're going to see is um, so. This is from Oregon. My two team members um, split up. I went to Texas, and then they went up to Oregon so we could just do more in less time. So uh, they met up with uh, three Mexican immigrant workers who were um, accosted in a parking lot by a man who threatened that he'd cut off one of their heads. So this is their story. OK. He was right here screaming, I'm going to cut your head off. You don't have any rights. We have cones uh, to that entrance. I think this one was open, and uh, he wanted to park right here. He pulled over and he started calling him names. Que nosotros este 
no pertenecíamos a, a, este, a este país. He got out of his car and he goes straight to Edu and start pushing him right here. Y después él se bajó del carro uh, y vino hacia mí a querer este, pelear conmigo. And that's when he grabbed the stick. He was like, he was gonna, he wanted to protect himself, right? Él dijo que nosotros no teníamos este, derechos aquí, que si él nos cortaba la cabeza a nosotros o si nos hacía algo, nadie iba a, a decir nada. The police show up and, and he would, they were asking us a whole bunch of questions. Los policías hablaron con, con él. Yo pienso que ellos no le creyeron a él su historia. Nos creyeron la historia de nosotros y él fue arrestado. The police officer told me that this, this, is, this kind of stuff is not going to happen in my town. And if this happened again, if anybody called you names, like racial names, you know, or treat you different, it's called a hate crime. And you need to call the police. I think the challenges with this case was that there, are, there wasn't very good documentation. So there were some blurry photos and video that was like haphazardly recorded, which makes sense, right? In a scuffle between some individuals, it can be hard to uh, document something like that when you're stressed, anxious, afraid, someone's coming at you. But uh, it underscores the importance of that. And, and unfortunately, the burden of that is is in this case was put on the victim. The outcome of the trial was a not guilty verdict. I think two important takeaways are that a lot of white community members specifically are still not familiar with the issues of like hate and bias. I think the audience of the jury was not prepared to be maybe as receptive as other groups of okay. people could be. We can stop it, Chris. Jake, can I say something? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> So I know a lot of y'all are here because you have to like turn a paper or do something specific to this project. So I'm gonna try to help you guys out. So one of the main reason why this story or this project was so important is because of how timely it was. If you look at the things that are going on today in our society, things have been happening for a very long time, but things have kind of ramped up at this time and point in our society. So if you look at the time when we started doing this project and look at the events that have taken place since we've done this project, it kind of puts a bow on everything. It kind of just highlights how timely this project was. So not only were the stories important, the reason why it received national attention and people picked up these stories is because of how timely it was. So if you look at everything that's going on, I think that kind of tells the story of why we chose to do this project. And, and I would say, uh, and I, I was thinking the same thing that he, he was just talking about, of course, but um, the importance of this project is not just its national implications and um, the product that we put out, but what it means to people like you and what it means to um, the students who enroll in this program and, in my estimation, um, become much better journalists. Um, I'm sure that the three people sitting with me right here would agree when I tell you that um, I have very high expectations for people in the program. I believe that every time we do a project, um, you, they, have to get better every day at trying something new, that you can't be afraid, that we will help coach you through those things that are fearful. And let me tell you something. Every time I sent these people out to one of these places, though they may not have known it, I would go home every night and I'd think, oh, God, please don't let anything happen to them. Please, what will I say to their parents? I mean, what will I tell Dean Callahan? I mean, you know. So, I mean, it, this is something that I take very seriously, and it's also a very rigorous program. I mean, it, it is stressful. The demands are incredibly high. Would you say that it's stressful? I'm too blessed to be stressed, so I don't know. <laughs> Angel? I'm not. <laughs> Come on, what were you really thinking? Um, I thought you were going to have a heart attack every day. Yeah, she's right. Um, I'm pretty sure I lost maybe three years off my life, I think. Oh, but that's an that's an exaggeration. But oh my God, Two hey, we got we, we got picked up by USA Today, so it, it's all good, right? It's all good. But no, um, truly, you know, we joke around about it being, you know, devastatingly kind of stressful, and you kind of walk in the office with all of your comrades, feeling the just psychological weight of the expectations crushing you a bit, because you know, with with long investigative stories like this, things don't go smoothly at all. They truly don't. We start in January, but 
I think I, when I speak for my own team, I don't think we truly understood where exactly we were going to go until, you know, we came into the newsroom. And that's just the way it goes sometimes. Um, other times, you know, you have groups that are just spot on. They, they cultivate their sources straight from January all the way into the summer. Things go good. And then you have teams like mine who, you know, managed to <laughs> clinch it out in the end. But that's because, you know, when the impossible task, you know, when you have an impossible task in front of you, it's amazing what you can do when the impossible is also necessary at the same time. So, yeah, not not only is it stressful, it takes a toll on you mentally, because at the end of the day, these are real people sharing real stories with you. So. If you think about it, you're listening to these tragic events daily over and over again, and people are sharing these stories with you. So you have to take a step back and you have to, you know, make sure that you're okay yourself because at the end of the day, like these are real things that happen to real people. So when they're telling you these stories, they're reliving these moments, and you're basically living these moments with them, and it can take a toll on you. And that's one of the things, not only about this program, but about storytelling in general. It doesn't matter what kind of storytelling or what, what technique you're using to tell the story. Is, is um, There's lots of things that I think that the young journalists learn in this program, but most importantly, I think, are um, a, a multitude of abilities. But one is to approach very uncomfortable situations. And, the, and another is to truly talk to people when you're interviewing them. So what do I mean by that? Well, for years before I was um, an investigative reporter and editor, which was most of my career, but um, despite having worked in places all over the country in TV and um, newspapers, I actually started out uh, in Arizona, and I'm a native of Arizona, and worked for the Arizona Republic for the first few years of my life. Um, one of the things that you learn is that you really have to learn more about a person's story. So we're very used to, um, in our business, of asking a question, how did you feel about that? What happened? And as soon as we get what we need, which is the answer to that, we move on to the next question. Um, what I challenge uh, reporters to do in this program is to go deeper than that, to understand what's happening in the community, to capture moments in the community, and of course the word that I'm sure all three of them hate to hear, is I'm always asking for something poignant, something that is unexpected, um, because I believe that the best uh, storytellers, whatever your story form is going to be, are those that look for outstanding pieces of information that are different and not predictable. Did you guys want to talk about any of that? Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, Ashley, first. I was just going to add to, um, well, a couple things. Like, um, when when Justin mentioned making sure you're okay and things like that, I think uh, one of the big things that kind of, I don't know, I, I really took note of was the diversity in the newsroom that we had and some of the ethical discussions that we had to have amongst one another. And then also the openness that the different reporters had in coming to one another and asking, oh, what do you think about this? Because you have this background kind of a thing. And I think that's really important in telling the story accurately. Because, you know, somebody's going to have a different perspective, a different pr opinion, because they've gone through different life experiences than you. And then the other thing I was going to add is I had the pleasure of traveling with um, a reporter. Her name was Allie Bice. She would say, I need to channel my inner Jackie. <laughs> and um, <Good> thing. <laughs> it was a good thing, because she, she kind of, I was able to kind of learn from her, too. And that was also one of the uh, one of the good things about News Two One was I was able to like kind of see other people, other reporters' techniques, and she would ask questions like, "Oh, well, what were you doing that day? What did you have on? What was in the drink that got thrown on you?" Kind of a thing, and then that just adds another layer to the story. Like you, you don't think about that kind of stuff when you're writing, but it makes a big difference. Like she got thrown rum and coke on her at a Kevin Hart concert, and now you get to go back and use that to fact check to see if there's records from the Kevin Hart concert, if there was an incident, that kind of thing. So definitely detail, 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 especially in investigative journalism, something like this. Sure, and just to, just to add on those ex expectations that Jackie outlined with being able to truly getting to know your um, source's story, I think that this summer made me a lot better with being able to cult not only cultivate a relationship with sources who are thousands of miles away from you, who you have to c convince that 
hey, I'm all the way in Arizona and you're in Florida, but you should totally like, you know, let us meet you and, uh, and spend a day with you in your house, that kind of thing. That's one of the skills that you, you really figure out quickly in News 21 because it's such a national project. And, you know, even though those people, beyond those people just being, you know, out of state, they look at the name News 21 and they're like, you're not Fox, you're not CNN, who are you? So you really got to figure out a way to explain to them why your story is truly important, why their story is truly important, and that you, you kind of got to switch your um, perspective in that it's not you, the reporter, who needs an answer from them. It's, it's not, you really got to demonstrate that you need their help, not just an answer, you need their help. You need them to go back in their memory and remember the most, the most awful things that have ever happened to them and trust you with that information. Um, since my team covered Latinos and immigrants, there were a lot of people that we talked to who were very scared about their immigration status. They were scared to give us their names sometimes. They were scared to tell us who did what to them. And honestly, part of that was, you know, what made our, our story unique in that there is this sense of fear that suppresses the reporting of hate crimes, um, you know, on top of the hate crimes already happening to these people, that kind of thing. So you really got to, you know, get your negotiation skills in check a little bit and you really got to be compassionate with these people and you got to be willing to spend days upon days with these people and their, you know, I'm not going to say habitat, but in their homes, so you can gather all these poignant moments that Jackie's talking about. Because I think a lot of us starting out when we're reporting, I'm like 22, so I, I still consider myself with you guys. Um, I think when a lot of us start out, we just do the thing where it's like, ask question, answer, you're good, run it, publish it. But that, that's truly not enough. If you want to do this, um, this program, you have to be able to you know, get someone's life experience in. You got to, you know, embed yourself with them for a couple of days. You basically have to push yourself. And I, I, I push everybody very hard. You were going to say something, Justin, before, I think. Yeah, I think you, and to add to all their points, you just have to truly, truly be unbiased. Like, no matter what situation you find yourself in, like, you have to understand that you're telling these people stories. Like, no matter whether or not how a person may feel about you, you have to make sure that they're not your enemy, you're not their enemy, that you're just willing to tell their story regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in. And there will be th things that come up in conversation in those interviews and you can't let them face you. Like if he calls you out of your name or if they say something that's derogatory towards your race, you can't take it personally because you're just there to tell that story. Because if you're not there to tell it, then who will? Um, and. I want to emphasize, too, that ultimately the purpose of the program, of course, is to make um, make the people who, the reporters and videographers who work on the on the program to be employable. In News 21, people all get, get great jobs. I mean, um, from this, this particular group, not everybody's graduated yet, obviously, but of course, Angels at the Arizona Republic, Allie, who worked with um, Ashley, is at Politico. Um, we have News 21 people who are at the Washington Post. We have News 21 people who are at the Miami Herald, the Tampa Bay Times, television stations, CNN, um, and a lot of a lot of these students share the common denominator of having worked on News 21 or other professional programs within Cronkite that really throw you into situations where you really have to learn how to um, talk to people. Um, get video, think of innovative ways to tell stories, and to um, be successful. Yeah, and to add to that, I think the people that you do meet in News 21, you know, they're, they're kind of the best of the best. So when you're working with those people in that newsroom, what, 40 hours a week, um, 9 to 5, or... 16. Six, 9 to 5, that's kind of short. I, I guess I didn't show up for most of the time, but... Um, you, you work with these people in such close quarters for so long, they kind of become your war buddies. And uh, like Jackie said, most of the people that do News 21 end up going to really good places. So, you know, the people that you meet, I can already see the people that I meet are going to go places, you know, way beyond probably what I even aspire to be. So in case I ever need help in my career, um, I think I can always reach out to these people. So there's always that. You find really fun people. 
Um, what kinds of questions do you have? You have to have some questions. You can't come to something and not, oh boy, it's gonna be too There's a mic right there. Has a question. Go ahead. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to them? <laughs> no. Okay. no, 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 I, no. Um, yeah, they were highs and lows. I'm not talking about it. Go ahead. It's most important you hear from them. Uh, I think the high of it was, I think, you know, when, when you do all of that reporting, you're kind of just in suspension and you're like, Wow, okay, cool, the website's out, documentary's out, what do I do with my life now? I gotta find a job, that kind of thing. But what really felt great was when, you know, publications started picking up our stuff and you start to feel a little bit of validation in what you did. You start to hear feedback from the people who you interviewed and you start to see how their lives have changed. I think that's truly the high of it. And I don't, I don't think we got, you know, any- Well, it was a low, it had to be a low. So Be careful I, what you say, though. <laughs> so I alluded to um, my team not really having it figured out until this summer of reporting. And you're, we're supposed to be reporting, right, by that summer, but my, my group was still stumbling a little bit. And so we, we'd try to have meetings to figure out our angle about how to tackle this huge behemoth, like, national story, right? But we also had Len Downey from the Washington Post who was there, along with Jackie, who was helping um, us, you know, figure out our direction. And I think, you know, in those, in those couple of meetings, it kind of humbles you a little bit. You start to figure out what you've been missing all along. Um, and uh, I, th I think what I can say was we had one meeting where I just sat down there and I like, I think that was when I lost like three years off my life. And then the next day or the next week we had our, our pitch together. So I'm not gonna go too into the details, but it really does uh, push you. And uh, I think, yeah, basically pressure makes diamonds, so. <laughs> Justin, highs and lows. Uh. I think a high for me was probably pressing export. I don't know how many of y'all have ever worked on like a uh, long form project, but like video editing, video editing can take a really, really long time. And to get 40 to 50 minutes out of something means you have to have at least probably 48 hours of video, like a lot of content. And that's a lot of watching, going backwards, going forward. So high point of my time in News 21 was definitely finishing that. And a low point uh, was probably looking at Jackie every day when I wasn't done because she would come in and say, how's it coming? And I'm like, it's coming. Don't know if it'll get done, but it's coming. Actually, to be fair to myself, I did pass by that edit bay five times a day and say, how's it going? How are you doing? Are you almost done? Um, so I can see where that would be a low point, but the important part was that it got done. Um, hi, oh, okay, low. So I don't know if you guys know what line editing is. <laughs> so, so what happens is, so those 20 interviews I told you about, we transcribe all of those, so we type all of those out, then we print them all out, and then we cut each line out, <laughs> and then we lay them all out on the ground, and then we put it together like that before we do any cutting of the video. So um, that part was probably the low. <laughs> and then finishing that part was probably a high because then it just kind of flows. Once you have that done, then it just goes together. But that was very time consuming. But it was actually very helpful and I would do it that way every single time now. But that was, I just stared at the floor for like a week straight probably. Um, Color coordinated everything. I would say that one of the things that um, everyone learns being involved in this program is is new ways to do difficult tasks because every task in News 21 is a challenge. And by that I mean not a challenge like you can't do it. It's a challenge because the expectations are high. There are it's a national expectations. Lots of people have um, given a lot of money to the program to to support new and changing ideas for journalism, and so there is a lot of pressure on that end. There was someone else who had a question. Anybody? Oh, yeah. Um, so there's been a little bit of criticism of some projects like yours for 
giving a platform to um, white nationalists uh, and basically showing both sides like good journalism does. Is that something you came across and how did you respond to it? So yeah, that happens sometimes, but the thing about journalism is there's always two sides of a story. So you can't have good journalism if you don't share both sides of that story. So in some cases you can feel like you're giving a platform to white nationalists or white supremacists or people of that nature, but you also have to show the people who are victimized by those people, you have to share the stories of the people who are considered to be the accusers or those attackers because sometimes you can have instances to where they can say that victim story wasn't true or the victim can say the attacker is lying, vice versa. So if you just share both of their stories, you can let your audience decide. That way you're not forming that narrative. That way you're not putting your own spin on the story. That way you're just telling true, pure journalism. I, I would add to that that the one thing um, that I know for a fact, uh, after doing this myself for 40-some years now, is that um, it doesn't matter how awful you think the person is that you're interviewing. It does not matter if they're on death row. It does not matter if they're the victim of a robbery. It does not matter. What matters is that everybody gets to have their say. And a good journalist, regardless um, of the situation or an uncomfortable situation, and I know that each of these three people here were probably in uncomfortable situations at different times is that it is our job, no matter what you're doing, to talk to everybody who's involved. And, and that is uncomfortable sometimes. Um, yeah, I would just like to add too, um, we interviewed, um, he's classified on SPLC as an anti-Muslim. He's the founder of Political Islam, uh, Bill Warner. And going into it, um, you know, you kind of have like your own kind of idea of what you're expecting going into it. And I think he, he also had his idea of what his perception of the media or journalists was. And then after we left this man's house and met his wife uh, two or three hours, I think, I, I mean, I can't speak for him, but we had great conversation. He, he invited us back, and I don't, I, you know, I wouldn't go back, but he invited us back, <laughs> and he was offering us food and dinner because we were two girls traveling by ourselves in the middle of Nashville to, or Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and um, I think you can't you can't have change if you're not open to a conversation, for one, you know. So no matter what your ideas or beliefs are, I feel like you should at least have the mindset that you're willing to listen, so. Yeah, and to that point, I had sweet tea with a Klansman. Like, I have no opinion about the guy, but I will say his tea wasn't the best, you know? You gotta tell the story about when the Klansman, when he answered the door. You gotta tell that story. So he opened the door, and I was with two young Caucasian women, and as you can see, I'm an African-American male. He opened the door, and he was a little surprised. He was like, uh, you do understand the nature of this interview, right? And I looked at him and I'm like, I kind of set up this interview. And so moving forward through that, we had a very good conversation. He had a nice gun safe in his house. I recognized the gun safe, so we started talking about guns. Uh, he wanted to join the military, but he didn't have the opportunity. I told him that I was prior service, so we had a great conversation about that. And halfway through the interview, if he didn't tell you he was a Klansman, you wouldn't know that he was a Klansman because we were having a regular dialogue and we were able to have a conversation and I was able to hear why he felt the way he felt and he said he had no indifference towards black people he just didn't want to see his race eradicated and he felt like this state was made for the white man and it should remain that way. And so the reason that I love for Justin to repeat this story is uh, first it goes to one thing we've already discussed which is being in uncomfortable situations but also being able to pivot in those uncomfortable situations because sometimes when you just face something head on because I must have said to Justin five times before we went to talk to the imperial wizard you sure you want to do this you sure it's all up to you I want you to do it but you got to want to do it because of course I'm thinking oh my god all the things that could go wrong and then I'm going to have to call somebody and then what's going to happen and then uh, so you know you and and so you have to take chances you know you sometimes you have to face not 
I'm not calling the Klansman the devil, but like in all things, you have to face something that's going to be uncomfortable for you to be successful. And to tell you the truth, if I had to sum up what News 21 does really well and what is expected is that um, the young journalists, whatever your skill sets are that are in the program, will be uncomfortable and that that discomfort will make you better. It will always make you better. And if you aren't in every job or mission that you happen to be on through your career, if you become too comfortable, then you know that you're not going to move further or improve unless you are. Any other questions? Anybody else? Any other comments here? Um, all I can tell you is that uh, it's very, this is very rigorous, um, but I know that we make great journalists, and if there's one thing I take away from it at the end of every summer is that we have made great journalists, and, or, or if they weren't great, they become great and they get better. And we're, do, we're serving a cause, which is doing stories and projects on issues of public importance. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.